because that's why you do what you do, right? So with, with that shared, we know that in order for transformation to occur and for students to uh, succeed and to eliminate race, ethnicity, and family income as the best predictors of who does succeed, we have to make sure that there is a strong foundational post-secondary experience. And that really means the first two years, the first 60 credits of the collegiate experience, wherever that transpires, right? So for purposes of work, those are the two definitions that, that are um, we're operationalizing in this. Now, let me talk about the why. And the why gets back to our mission statement a bit that I shared earlier. Um, I was listening to a podcast this weekend. Um, and in that podcast, the uh, uh, facilitators were, were talking about um, a national issue that was as great, they said, as... Uh, or a national threat, if you will, which was as great as uh, nuclear weapons and nuclear arms. And it sounded at first hyperbolic, but they began to delve into that. And what they were talking about and what they made abundantly clear with evidence was the rate at which students are not succeeding in K through 12 education. And when I listened to what they were describing, um, I it became completely very apparent to me that even though they were focused on K through 12, the same dynamic is ex exists in post-secondary education. And so um, our big why here and, and what they shared in their uh, podcast was that um, race, ethnicity and family income are the best predictors of who succeeds in K through 12 education, right? So um, the tragic element is in spite of that, there are students who uh, do make it to post-secondary education. And the tragic element there, not the tragic element is in spite of that, but the tragic element there is that once they do and they overcome the obstacle and odds associated with uh, the, the national threat in K through 12 education, they meet a comparable, really problematic design issue and uh, uh, set of design flaws in post-secondary ed. So to, to us, not just given our mission, but given the evidence that we've taken a look at, the big why behind all of this is the nation needs talent. Uh, the nation needs an educated, not just workforce, but citizenry. Uh, in order to have that, the nation needs a post-secondary education experience that's designed to actually yield that. And based on what we have seen and shown in our data and our research, working with hundreds of institutions to date, is we can make the case that institutions are designed to yield the exact opposite, despite what they may be saying, right? Despite what even a lot of the leaders, and we mean leaders at every level, want to believe or do say, right? The outcomes suggest that the system has serious design flaws within it. And so we're doing this effort because we know the first two years really matter. And we know the first two years are directly correlated with, if not a predictive of who completes. And right now the best predictors of who completes are associated with race, ethnicity, and family income. And we believe enough institutions care about that and enough institutions want help through community practice and with support from an entity like ours, that this opportunity is the right opportunity right now uh, in order to help the institutions and the broader communities of where they're a part uh, be much more productive and yield much more equitable student learning and educational outcomes, which in turn means they're designed so that every student can graduate. So I'll stop now, but I've defined key terms and I've talked about the big why. Uh, and in the process, I think answered all of your questions about that one, Katie, but I know you have other questions. <laughs> um, you did a great job, Drew. Thank you. So the Gardner Institute, you mentioned earlier, has been doing this work for nearly, excuse me, a quarter of a century. Um, so almost 25 years. Um, what lessons from the work are being drawn into the new effort around transforming the foundational post-secondary experience? And how does this new process work differ from what the Gardner Institute has done previously and is currently doing? So this is one of those uh, sets of questions, right? There, there, This is, a, I guess, in true survey design, this would not just be double-barreled, it would be quadruple-barreled. Although in fairness to you, Katie, 
I think I initially wrote this question. So play <laughs> so, yeah. so. Succinctness is uh, not, 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 no, not, it's an not in this question. Yeah. It's an antonym with, with Drew, so, right? So you can feel free to to not be succinct in your answer. Yes. Well, the, the good news is, uh, yeah, that's going to happen. But let me let me jump there real quick. And when I say jump there, talk a little bit about our work to date, and talk about some key lessons learned from that work, or at least uh, at a macro level, talk about who was involved and and the types of outcomes we've seen, right? And then we'll delve into a few more. Um, the Institute itself uh, was founded in 1999, right? We've just had our 24th birthday. We're moving towards our 25th, hence the reference of a quarter of a century. Um, over that period of time, we've worked with, uh, as of last week, 529 colleges and universities uh, across the globe, although disproportionately in the U.S., I would say about 97.5% U.S.-based, right? So, um, and they're institutions of all types, right? We have 56 HBCUs out of 100 total. So HBCUs are well represented. It's six out of 31 accredited tribal colleges, 81 out of about 400 Hispanic serving institutions. We have 149 community colleges in the work and 146 independent institutions in the work. So if I do a quick roll up, you know, I just wanted to share all of this. Two year, four year, public, private, they've all been involved in the types of work that we've done with the institutions. Across those institutions total, it's a little over 4.1 million undergraduate students, right? So a significant proportion of the uh, undergraduate student body in the United States. Um, and in the event folks wonder, we do, right? Um, you, what you can see here, and I won't go into uh, all the elements, but uh, African-American Latinx students are proportionately uh, more represented than uh, African-Americans and Latinx are in the U.S. population, right? So uh, there's some overrepresentation there. And that makes sense, right? Because that's the 21st century student demographic that's growing. Um, and when you uh, compare sort of all the race, ethnicity classifications, um, it's, it's majority non-white and about a little over 48% white in terms of uh, the, the student demographics. From a Pell, non-Pell, a little over a third, right, of the students uh, at the institutions we served have been Pell. So as we're talking about working with institutions so that race and this thing and family income are no longer the greatest predictors of who succeeds, we've been working with institutions that reflect the 21st century student demographic very much, and we've been making efforts to uh, eliminate race, ethnicity, and family income as the best predictors of who succeeds. Um, now, the, the quick summary on all of this, the average enrollment in institutions is a little over 7,800, although it ranges. We've had institutions as small as about 300 undergraduates. We've had one over 100,000 undergraduates, right? So, um, uh, and uh, about 70% are four-year and about 30% two-year, the same uh, in terms of public and private comparison, and not quite 30% are uh, MSIs. Um, and this means that disproportionately, we've been working with historically white institutions that increasingly have a diversifying student body. So in many instances, the institutions were never designed to work with the students that they currently enroll. And often there are policies and practices and procedures and elements in place that rarely if ever have been questioned, if they were questioned and considered and analyzed from a, using disaggregated data and other frameworks for analysis, they should be questioned and they should be redesigned, right? Um, so it kind of gives you a sense of who we've worked with. A little bit more in terms of some of the outcomes we've seen in the work that we've done. And this is supported by external evaluation. At least it was external until September 1, uh, 2023. Our good colleague, now our senior vice president for um, re operations and research, Dr. Brent Drake. He's with us now here. And I said, as of September 1, he's taken that role. For 13 years prior, he uh, served as a research fellow and did external evaluation for the Gardner Institute, right? So based on his analyses and uh, over the course of time, what we can say is institutions that we've worked with 
have seen significant increases in first to second year IPEDS retention rates. You'll see here that uh, the institutions over a five year period of time uh, in our first year redesign efforts had uh, a 5.62 percentage point increase and IPEDS retention rates. These were disproportionately open access and or low selectivity institutions. It doesn't mean there wasn't a flagship research university or two in here, but disproportionately uh, access uh, was fairly open. Um, and I will say they got better by actually getting better by working with the students they had, not by closing the door or limiting opportunities, right? So we, we see this outcome. And I also say we see it at the same point in time where nationally retention rates remain flat and even in some years dipped, right? So this was um, something that ran against the, the curve or the trend nationally that was going on. Uh, Dr. Drake did an analysis recently of the same institutions just to say, well, what happens if you improve first year outcomes? And lo and behold, I mean, we predicted this, but it's good to actually be able to say it. Um, those institutions recorded significant increases in both four, five, and six year grad rates. We were, and again, this is at ranging from a little over six percentage point to a four percentage point uh, increase across those uh, uh, three lenses for analysis. So we're excited about that. We were equally actually more so excited about the following, and that is uh, those grad rate outcomes were frequently matched, if not exceeded, when disaggregating grad rate outcomes by race, ethnicity. So grad rate outcomes for African-Americans, Latinx, and Native American st uh, students were uh, generally as large, if not larger, than the average increases we saw in four or five, six-year grad rates, right? So we saw these types of, of outcomes. What we also saw through analysis that Dr. Drake did, we, well, institutions paid to work with us to do this work, right? And um, so we said, well, what type of return on investment was there? And without belaboring this too much, um, it suffices to state that Dr. Drake used both IPEDS enrollment and retention and grad rate data, as well as IPEDS financial data to create an actual sort of uh, dollar amount equivalent of student based on institutional proportionate enrollments in state, out of state, in district, out of district. There were all different fee structures there. And we couldn't say, oh, Katie was retained and she was from out of state. We just said, okay, per student, this is sort of the average tuition and fee structure. And then just taking these analyses that you saw and saying, well, what did they pay to work with us? What Dr. Drake found is that uh, there was a $26.40 and actual retention related revenue for every dollar that the institutions paid for, to the Gardner Institute to do the work, right? Now they invested some resources in themselves to do the work as well, above and beyond what they, they paid to work with us. But uh, there, the return on investments, um, the investments range between $10,000 to $75,000 on average. And the return on investments were anywhere from about a half to a $2 million return based on what they, they put in there. Now, what I'm not doing is guaranteeing you that. I'm just saying all these analyses have uh, informed what we're doing have over the past, particularly 10 years. And they're definitely informing what we're doing in the transforming the foundational post-secondary education process. So quick summary on all this, 24 year old not-for-profit, deep work and experience and thought leadership in various areas of the undergrad experience, right? You, you don't have the phrase, the first year experience, if it wasn't for the namesake, John N. Gardner at the Gardner Institute, right? Um, Betsy Barefoot. And, and there are many other aspects where um, our uh, current staff have been thought leaders in the work in teaching, learning, and student success, and across all sorts of higher ed sectors, as I showed you, two-year, four-year, public, private. Um, but particularly in institutions that have been, quote unquote, historically white, but have significant enrollments of African-American, Latinx, Indigenous, as well as Pell eligible students, right? So we bring that expertise and the demonstrated results that I alluded to or didn't allude to flat out shared with you earlier. So I'm going to stop that sharing for now, Katie, because enough of the slides from me. But all of this is shaping and going into uh, what we're doing. There are differences, though, 
And I know you want to ask me, but like, great, Drew, you had those outcomes. Why would you do anything different if you had those types of outcomes, right? So I'm going to turn it back to you so you can, I don't know, ask me more questions and maybe I can go into that and other things. Thanks, Drew. Um, so I do have one more question um, that we didn't talk about before. So I'm throwing you a curve. No, throw me one. That, that's fine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so as I look at the list of participants, I see a lot of names from a lot of institutions that we've worked with before. And yep. so I'm wondering, um, how does this new process, does it, it, does it apply to an institution who's already completed a process? Or is this just for institutions who are new to our work? Uh, it, it both, right? Um, and I will talk a little later about the numbers of institutions we're looking for in this work. Um, I would think at least in the very first cohort, we'd want a good proportion of institutions we've worked with before because um, they know what it's like to work with the Gardner Institute. They know what it's like to do uh, data lists and evidence-based work and set that up. And by having them maybe a little disproportionately overrepresented in the very first cohort of this effort, uh, they'll serve as leaders for other institutions that come in as sub in subsequent cohorts. And I'll get into those numbers in a little bit, but it's a yes and. Yes, we are looking for institutions that we have worked with and maybe have done some work in gateway course redesign or first year redesign or uh, you know curricular redesign, what have you. But what we're looking to do is uh, further deepen those aspects of the work, and I'll go into how that happens, but also address other areas because um, our experience strongly suggests, and it's actually quite maddening, that it's not enough to redesign gateway courses. It's not enough to redesign the first year experience. You actually have to harmonize all of those efforts um, and others, and not just stuff you do with the Gardner Institute, by the way, in order to make an intentional whole that uh, yields greater outcomes than the disparate pieces, right? So short answer, we would love to have institutions who have worked with us before, even working with us right now involved in this work. We also wanna have some institutions that haven't worked with us before, that, but that also demonstrate a readiness, a willingness and ability to do this work, right? It's not all about, well, you had to have worked with us before in order to do this. It's a, it's a yes and, so glad you asked. Thank you, I appreciate that. So how is the Gardner Institute supporting this work? And um, what kind of support are we going to provide to the institutions who partner with us in this work? So there I will um, jump in again into the, the deck that we have, or I, and I want to talk a bit about um, how we will do this, right? Um, and this, by the way, gets back to a question you asked me earlier. So I'm gonna start by answering an earlier question a little bit more, right? Um, and then jumping into the ways that we'll do this. Um, as I shared with you, there were some sort of maddening or frustrating elements, like we would help institutions or even whole systems in some states redesign gateway courses. And we'd see some, significant increases in course success rates, otherwise known as decreases in course failure rates. Um, and it would correlate with the retention improvements, but not to the extent that we had fully hoped, right? And, or at least not to the degree that we hoped. And, um, and I'm not trying to be disparaging about efforts. It's hard work to do that. Um, but it was largely because um, in a number of instances, there were some design issues that we had to address, and we're factoring those in here. The first design issue, remember that 5.62 percentage point increase in IPEDS retention rates I talked about, that was correlated with the degree to which an institution uh, indicated that the institution implemented their plan. So here's the crazy heretical thing that came out of that institutional representatives had to say we were high implementers of our plan in order to realize those types of outcomes. Any other form of implementation, particularly low and no, was correlated with attrition, right? So they, the, the high implementers had enough pull and weight. Their differences were so great, right, that the average increase across all institutions was pretty significant, right? But 
it was only the high implementers that experienced those types of outcomes. So one of the design elements in all this is we have to work with institutions to help them implement to a high degree, right? So that that's that's factored in, that's part of the design. Another aspect on all of this, and we heard this time and time again, as a matter of fact, it was the number one reason why institutions or at least institutional representatives um, personifying a, a college or a university, but the folks who worked there, who responded to our surveys and talked with us, when they didn't implement or they didn't implement at a high degree, they told us the main reason for this is because the provost left, the vice provost left, the president left. We need to make sure that this work isn't synonymous with one person, right? We need to make sure that there's distributed leadership. And part of the design of the Transforming the Foundational Post-Secondary Experience effort takes into account that leadership exists on many levels in many constituencies and communities. So we're going to work with faculty leadership, uh, administrative leadership, staff leadership, and that'll be baked in in a continuous manner over the years in which an institution is engaged here. So that if somebody does win Powerball and they did in California last week, right, and, and opts not to keep doing this, um, the project itself isn't derailed because they left, right? So that's a, that's a big part. The other piece is fostering a long-term commitment to change. Um, one of our uh, board of trustee members during our most recent board meeting was talking about the leadership uh, that they had at Elon University. Uh, he's president emeritus after 19 years, Dr. Leo Lambert. And um, he made the comment that it takes 10 years at least to get hard things done. And I know that if we were to turn and say, so come on and sign up now for a 10 year engagement with the Gardner Institute, uh, that'll go nowhere fast. But what I do know is I, I need to be quite clear and not disingenuous and say, this is a long march. Sometimes it may be a slog. Let's be forthright. You have to make a long-term commitment to this. And part of the frustrating uh, elements associated with the type of outcomes in the research that I've shared earlier is that we did see those improvements in first-year retention rates or course improvement rates, but it was only for a few years. And in some cases, it really waned. So in order for long-term change to be long-term change, there has to be a long-term commitment to this work and that's designed into it as well. And then the other piece with all of this is institutions will often tell us we have 17 different things going on and I have no clue how they all commit. We have a siloed environment, right? So we're not just interested at the Gardner Institute in figuring out how we link and sync things we do with you. The way we design this is we want the all the things you're doing in the name of student success to be harmonized. We may not be able to do that. As a matter of fact, we won't be able to do that overnight with you. That's why many institutions haven't been able to do it over decades, right? But part of the design of this over the five years of engagement in this work is to harmonize the disparate pieces so that we identify redundancies, uh, you know, duplication of effort, particularly unwanted duplication of effort. Sometimes duplication of effort is a good thing if it's informed by design and it, it yields the benefits. Um, we address gaps uh, and we figure out ways in which silos can be, if this is a thing, de-siloed, right? And uh, efforts more harmonized. And then this, this last one, it gets back to that harmonization piece, but um, we have designed this work so that it recognizes even when you get it right. A year or two later, you may not have the right recipe anymore. A good friend and colleague of the Gardner Institute once said to me, and this is Shirley Malcolm out of the American Association for the Advancement of Sciences. She said, you know, Drew, we have to make sure we keep doing things like you do with institutions because fixed don't stay fixed, right? And uh, so it's with a nod to Shirley to say, fixed is never done. Your students will change your faculty, staff, your leadership will change. The communities in which your institutions are a part will change. And those changes in dynamics need to be considered as you're doing the work you are doing with students, right? So all of these are baked into our efforts to do better around the foundational post-secondary experience. So this is our approach, Katie, right? You, you, you asked me what does include. We'll bring our deep experience in uh, transformation and redesign work with 529 colleges and universities to date. And we'll look to have 45 to 60 institutions working with us by 2027, 2028. 
in this redesign work. Now they're going to do it in cohorts, right? They're not all going to be in the same place, but um, at least that many actively involved and engaged in this work so that we eliminate race, ethnicity, family income, and both of those correlate with one zip code pretty closely as the best predictors of who can graduate. Okay? And I want to emphasize that that phrase can graduate. We've had people turn and say, people turn to me and say, Drew, you just want to give everybody an A and give everybody a diploma. Um, I'd like to tweak that. I'd like to structure the institution and work with like-minded educators so that they can structure their own institutions so everyone can graduate if high expectations and high support are correlated and students can actually complete. And right now, based on what I shared earlier and what we've seen in our research, they're not structured, so that is the case. But by and large, there are some exemplary uh, institutions out there that are doing this well, but they're doing it well with their students and their model may not work for you, right? So that's the element in all of this, right? That's the, that's the big approach. Now, let me get into our how we're gonna do this, right? We are looking for uh, 45 to 60 institutions. And ideally, those institutions will have at least 25% PAL and or students of color, right? If you're 23%, we'll still talk to you, right? It's not, you know, etched in stone, Moses brought it down from the mountaintop and we must abide by it, right? It's, it's a, a rate because we want to make sure that we're working with institutions that have a significant enrollments of uh, students who represent the 21st century dynamic or, or the 21st century demographic rather. We're currently looking for 10 to 15 institutions to participate. We're not looking for the 45 to 60, right? We'd like to start on, on our board, a cohort of 10 to 15 institutions. And we'll look to have an application uh, fully functional by December of this year and accept applications for the work through early 2023. And then start the onboarding of those institutions by spring 2023, probably in April, May, initial onboarding of institutions before org. We want a five-year commitment, and we want a five-year commitment with a nod to Leo Lambert, because it takes at least 10 years to get hard things done, and with a nod to the foundations that are supporting this work, um, they're interested in supporting an initial phase of this work, and we want to work with you so that in subsequent phases, when this is successful, when we've learned from it and whatnot, and there's added foundation support, you can be involved and make perhaps another five-year commitment to take us to reach that 10-year goal, right? But right now we're looking for a five-year commitment to institutions. And there is modest but real financial commitment on the part of institutions. The costs are offset with support from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, ECMC Foundation. And right now there are two other foundations that have uh, invited proposals and are considering them. I'm just not gonna name them. Good news with invited proposals is they tend to get awarded. Uh, but we also know that it's not awarded until their boards approve it, right? So one, an additional foundations board will consider it in December and another one will consider it in February. So there's, there's strong external support for this work, but in every case they've said, and they've recognized, and we recognize that institutions take to take, tend to take things most seriously when they have some of their own resources in this, their own financial resources. So they'll, they'll be an, a, an institutional commitment, right? It is a 10 year goal with the five year commitment. Let me tell you what this looks like, right? Yes, this is a wheel uh, and it is a wheel, if you look at it, that never ends, right? You get in from an initial intake and it seems to keep going around and around with a nod to Shirley Malcolm again, that's because fixed don't stay fixed. This is a continuous improvement structure, continuous improvement approach. And this is our visualization of that approach, right? Our work is really done in four phases. An initial discovery phase with you where the Gardner Institute will work with the institution to uh, bring you in, onboard you, and use a number of assessments with your entire institutional community, faculty, staff, even students, to understand um, where you are on the transformation journey and also to understand how ready, willing, and able you are to do some of this work, right? So we'll use a uh, institutional transformation assessment that was piloted almost 10 years ago by the Gates Foundation. Uh, it's now something that the, uh, the Gardner Institute owns 
um, and works with other institutions to use. And then we'll also use a readiness, willingness, and ability survey that we created to really help figure out what fits you best, right? We're not coming in this and saying everybody has to do course redesign or everybody has to do first year redesign to start. What we are saying is we need to do some initial intake assessment and then we'll come visit you and we'll help make sense out of that. And you'll help shape next step decisions in terms of what is next. And that will be complemented by some capacity development work, right? You did this whole readiness, willingness and ability survey so we could see, well, where are you ready? And where might you need to develop some capacities in order to continue to thrive and succeed, right? So during the first year, based on the survey outcomes, the sense making that we've done, we'll then work with you to uh, further develop uh, your faculty, staff, and students, and also capitalize on the strengths they already have, right? We're not taking a deficit model in all this, but we do know there will be some gaps or some opportunities for continued improvement. We'll also know even where you have strengths, you may want to even get stronger yet, right? So we'll do that. Um, we'll do that through institutional data capacity evaluation. We'll do that through work with senior leadership. Now I know we'll probably scare people by putting boards and cabinets down. That is an option, right? We've been working with the Association of Governing Boards to really think about and work with some institutions in Kentucky with how do boards and cabinets need to support this work? If this is a 10 year heavy lift strategic plan, your boards better be behind this. Now that's shared, we can't make your boards do this, right? So it is an option in some of this work. Leadership, deans, department heads, and faculty leadership as well, as well as staff leadership, right? So all this capacity development will be started it's really the, the second half of the first year, and it'll continue throughout the remaining of five-year engagement. So the, those, that's where those pieces fit, right, on this logic model. And the Gardner Institute is providing all that support, all that infrastructure. You'll need a task force to do this work. I will say that, right? We can't do this work for you, right? So we'll work closely with that task force to do it. But that's where those pieces fit in this model. That brings us to the third phase, and that's deep support for redesigning various aspects of the foundational post-secondary experience. Now, we don't know what aspects need to be redesigned at your institution. It could be the first college year. It could be gateway courses. It could be the curriculum. It could be uh, ongoing leadership capacity development, right? Which is why we're not coming in and saying, everybody will do this, 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 and this. What we're saying is based on the assessment and evaluation that we've done with you and the guidance you give us, because you're the local context experts, we're going to build a five-year map and we're going to identify what pieces should fit where. And then we're going to work with you to continuously monitor that and update that as evidence suggests it needs to be updated, right? But normally institutions go out and work with us on a thing, gateway course redesign, we still want to factor in those things. We got great experience doing that work. We just want to factor in in ways that make the most sense to, with you and your institutional context, right? So that's deep support that'll kick off in the second year and continue out through the fifth year of the project, right? And that fits down here, sort of the creation of a plan, the implementation of the plan, ongoing refinement and scaling of that plan. And that brings us to the last phase of this work, right, or stage of this work, and that has to do with on sc ongoing scaling evaluation capacity development, right? So it is, as Shirley said, fixed don't stay fixed. So as we implement the plan that you've created in multiple areas, we want to continue to refine it, figure out where it needs to be scaled, figure out where it needs to be tweaked, and also in the process, uh, figure out how it connects with other things that you're doing at the institution, right? So, and those are the latter phases of the work here. So that kind of gives you a sense. Now, let me talk real quick. Why us, right? And I don't mean that like, oh, well, ways me. I, I mean it from a standpoint of like, well, why would you work with the Gardner Institute on this work? Here's what I will tell you. You have to do this work. Maybe you're already doing it. You don't need the Gardner Institute. Or maybe you have a better option other than the Gardner Institute. All I'm going to say to you is do it, whether it's with us or not, right? You must transform the foundational post-secondary education experience for the well-being, as I said earlier, right? It's right up there with uh, nuclear threats. It's a national threat and it's an institutional threat. It's a local threat. You have to address that threat and turn it into a strength 
for your institution, but most importantly for the students you serve. So in our role, if you want us to, we will be your critical friends. I emphasize the term friend, but there are some things we can point out or say to you that you probably know, but couldn't say to your faculty and staff for a whole host of reasons, right? But we can. So that's one of the benefits of having an entity like us involved in this work. Another element in all of this is the deep experience we bring, right? I mentioned earlier about uh, thought leadership on the first year, thought leadership on course redesign, thought leadership on curricular redesign, even coming up with the words that are now part of the higher ed lexicon, but they weren't before staff members at the Gardner Institute coined the phrases, right? So you're going to want that type of experience, or you can benefit from that type of experience. And we shared the outcomes that we have. We're providing that structure and support. And we also have experience linking this type of work with other strategic priorities, such as SAC COC uh, quality enhancement projects, higher learning commission quality initiatives. Right? I can't guarantee you that your accreditor will turn around and say, oh, you're doing that? You pass. What I can tell you is we have worked with institutions to link and sync this type of work with what those uh, accrediting bodies want and encourage their institutions to do, right? Uh, and then, as I mentioned earlier, the return on investment aspects. So I'm going to stop there, Katie, because that was a lot. I do know you have a couple other questions uh, for us and me, so I stopped the screen share for now. Yeah, thanks, Drew. Um, before we go on to my questions, we've had quite a few in the chat. So I thought I would ask a couple of those to go you. Go for it. Yep. Um, and, and there's there's a few that are that are all um similar that are talking about um working with K through 12 colleagues. So the first question says, does the Institute believe we need to work much more closely with K to 12 college? colleagues, sorry, to address the bridge that carries students from secondary to post-secondary ed education. And um, there's another question that asks about dual enrollment. So how does that play into this? So yeah. if you could address that, and then I have one more after that. Sure, sure. So the, the short answer to that is absolutely. And now let me uh, delve into that a bit more. Um, a number of you uh, who are with us today, and it, it's it's awesome to keep seeing the enrollment numbers uh, popping up on this, but uh, are um, known to come from the discipline of history. By the way, we love all disciplines, right? But as a American studies historian type, I recognize a number of the historians here. Um, and you um, know of work that the Gardner Institute has been doing with uh, Annie Evans and Ed Ayers from New American History um, out of the University of Richmond. So I mentioned that simply because one of the conversations I've had or we've had with uh, Ed Ayers around this work uh, has been that the post-secondary experience actually is starting in the ninth and 10th grade. Now it may be set up based on what already is happening in um, Head Start and uh, you know pre-K, but it's absolutely positively occurring in dual enrollment in early college in the ninth and 10th and 11th and 12th grades. So we'd be remiss if we arbitrarily or uh, rather artificially were to say, well, it has to be when they start, quote unquote, the 13th grade, right? So what we would encourage you to do is identify some of the primary K through 12 partners in the work and have them involved in your transformation team and transformation strategy and help have, let them help you as you attempt to help them, right? Sorry, I'm sounding like Jerry Maguire there. But um, you absolutely need to involve those colleagues in this work. Just as if you're a four-year receiving institution, you need to involve your key community college transfer partners in this work. And or if you're a primary sending institution, a community college, your primary receiving institution on the four-year level. Now, I'm, I'm uh, complicating this, but the structure we provide and the experience we build uh, uh, bring with us. Help us help you to do that, but I would also say we encourage you to do that. So that should be part of the design. Just last week, as a matter of fact, a week ago today, we were speaking with a, uh, a colleague, in this case at the Indiana Commission for Higher Education, Michelle Ashcraft, and uh, specifically focused on trying to figure out how dual enrollment in early college can be better factored into this work. We haven't fully done that yet, but we know we need to, right? It needs to be part of the design. So um, I hope you are getting a sense that um, 
we want that involved. We don't have a separate early college or dual enrollment module, but we could build that into some of what we're considering for curricular redesign and also efforts around course redesign. So I, I touched on those, uh, may have created more questions than I answered, Katie, but uh, in the spirit of making sure we address a number of other questions, I'll turn it back to you for now. Thank you. Um, and I'm having little technical issues. So I was just making sure I was unmuted. Um, so one of the other questions is, can we tell if recent improvement rates might also be tied to pandemic related changes in post-secondary education from 20 to 22? Um, I'm just going to go with a no. Um, and that, that's literally not no, they're not, but no, we can't tell because our analyses um, have been going on for about 10 years, but we have not yet factored in because we're using publicly available data, uh, pandemic influence cohorts into that mix. So what you see here is a uh, strong history the deep history of Gardner Institute work, but it hasn't taken into account yet students who started in 2020, 2021. And that is obviously a variable that needs to be factored into the design work going forward as well, right? So uh, short answer, no. Uh, and I don't want to overstate or overpromise. Thanks, Drew. So we have another question. Have you looked into personalizing the education for students, focusing on their strengths and needs and backgrounds? So our primary, and it's a fantastic question. They're all fantastic questions, by the way, but, but this is a fantastic question for uh, uh, many, many reasons. Our, the focus or the unit of analysis in our work is the institution and or the system of which those institutions are a power. So we're focusing on institutions in turn, personalizing the educational experience for the students they serve. So no, the Gardner Institute hasn't done that directly, but we have done that directly with institutions that in turn do that. So I wanna emphasize, even though I talk about all the students and the demographics enrolled in the institutions that we've served, we're looking to transform institutions that in turn are looking to make a transformational educational experience with the students they've had. Personalized approaches to education have to be a part of that mix, but we don't do that directly with students. We do it directly with the institutions who work with the students. Thank you. Um, excellent answers. I appreciate it. Um, we did have a question about, um, I'm a member of the Governor's State University and part of the Gardner Summer Cohort. How is what you're discussing today, which is great, different from what we are learning in that cohort? So um, Governor's State was involved in our curricular analytics community. That is one of about 18 different experiences that the Gardner Institute offers currently. What we're looking at doing, and I think that was uh, Joy Patterson who shared that question, yeah. is not to say, hey, we're gonna do one thing with you but to build a five-year plan as opposed to a five-week experience um, followed by a year-long community practice, but rather build a five-year plan so that things like the curricular analytics community can be linked and synced with other things we do with you and other things that Governor State is doing with other projects and create a plan that drastically increases in the best of ways um, the uh, student success outcomes at the institution and particularly focus on eliminating inequitable performance gaps. So this is different because it's not one thing. It's rather an approach that allows you to combine all things possibly and create an intentional whole that's greater than all the disparate pieces. Now, if you say to me, but Drew, that's so hard. My question is, it's also really hard to keep doing everything you're doing and not figuring it out where redundancies are. And particularly it's problematic because what you'll probably see is some students and it correlates directly with wealth and privilege, take advantage of all of those or many of those opportunities and many students, and again, it correlates with wealth and privilege, don't. And those are the design pieces that we wanna make sure are factored in intentionally into what we do with you. So how's this different? Joy, it's not just a program, it's an intentional approach to linking all programs so that 
results and outcomes can be maximized and inequitable performance gaps to the extent feasible in this short period of time can be eliminated. And note I said short period in five years. Again, this gets back to it's going to take 10 years at least to get this hard thing done. But the work that they've done this summer and so far in that curricular redesign isn't for naught. It will be. Oh, built no, 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 not at all. Not at all. No, and it can be factored in. And as a matter of fact, it may be something that will be built on. And notice I use the term may because I don't know what governor's state's going to find in the initial six months of set, since making an evaluation. I wouldn't be surprised if it was, though. Right. And as a matter of fact, I'd encourage that. But we want to let that sense making experience, that survey, that foundational uh, contextualization work shape what goes forward. So to your point, Joy, you could and you should factor that into the work. Thank you. Um, so back to one of my questions. So how many institutions do we want to work with? And what are the characteristics of the institutions we're looking to do this first phase with? So I mentioned this a, a bit earlier. Sorry, I'm being redundant right now, Katie, but I am glad you're asking. Right now, we're looking for 10 to 15 institutions to get involved. If we had an overwhelming response rate and they were all awesome, which I hope they are, right? We may uh, accept more, but stage the degree or the level to which institutions are involved, right? Um, overall, over a five-year period, um, we hope to have up to 60 institutions involved in this work, but we're not going to take all 60 to start, right? We want to stage this and scale this over time. So right now we're looking for the initial, the sort of founding 10 to 15, the first cohort out of three cohorts. Uh, we'll do up to 15 in the first cohort. We'll do another 15 to 20 in the second cohort, and then we'll do another 20 to 25 in the third. That's how we get somewhere between 45 to 60. Excellent. Thank you. And, and you asked me, you asked me the other thing, like, what should they look like? Oh, right. Yes. Yeah. Two year, four year, public, private, uh, as long as their student demographic approximate 25% either Pell and or African American, Latinx, Indigenous, you'll, you'll, you'll fit. And like I shared, if you're a little lower or a lot higher, that's okay. Right. Sorry, Katie. Did I lose you? I may have. Oh, there you are. You're back. There we go. I don't know what happened. Um, yeah, I, I lost everybody for a minute. So maybe it was just on my end. I'm not sure. It's all good. Um, I think you were going to ask me, um, what's the fee structure and how can institutions apply? That is exactly what I was going to ask you. Yeah, it seemed logical at the. So I mentioned we have um, two foundations that have already uh, provided funding to do some of this work. Um, we have another two that are considering funding, and it was an invited consideration. So those are good signs. Signs point to yes, uh, but again, we need to to hear what their boards. Uh, finally say. When we looked at this and said, okay, this is a huge undertaking, working with 60 institutions to transform the foundational post-secondary experience, what's it going to cost us? And we priced out all the work that would have to go on with this, sense-making, um, the administration of surveys, the types of things we were to do with you. It, it comes close to $15 million over the five-year period of time, right? It's not insignificant. The good news is the foundations have paid over seven and a half million, right? So to, or will by the looks of things with the, the pending and the ones that were commitments have already been made. So then we turned around and said, well, then what is it? The remaining elements on there. Um, we wanna take a um, model that takes into account institutional enrollment sizes, right? Uh, because if we said it's the same price for everyone, we recognize that small enrollment institutions get hit harder by doing that. So we'll start with a band um, that for institutions between uh, or up to 1,500 students, uh, we'll increase that from a little over, well, 1,501 to about 3,000, and then we'll go up from there. So we'll have 
bands that scale to institutions with 10,000 plus undergraduates. We'll base that simply on what's in College Navigator, which is the iPads data that your institutions all submit. So ultimately you're the source on that, uh, or your institutions are the source on that, your IR offices are the support on are the source on that. And we'll base that on a, a fee per year model. Again, five-year commitment, uh, the lowest enrollment band is uh, in sort of in a low $20,000 range. We're finalizing that based on the, the pending foundation support. And we'll just have you or need you to make that commitment over a, a five-year period of time. What we want to make sure is clear here that some may turn and say, okay, well, um, that's a cost. And my answer is, yes, it is. There's also a cost associated with uh, doing this work on your own um, and or not doing the work at all. Right. So you need to contextualize it as an opportunity cost in terms of doing this work. We have discussed this with a number of institutions already, and um, their feedback was that's very reasonable. The, the good news with all of this is when you look at all the things we do, if you were to do this in a la carte manner with us, we are a not for profit organization like nearly all the colleges and universities that are here and like all the colleges and universities are here. We charge tuition, right? If you look at what we do, it's usually on an a la carte basis, significantly higher than that. So this is the uh, New Jersey boardwalk pay one price, uh, you know, dividend where it, it it pays to sort of buy in bulk sort of a thing, right? So, um, and we'll have applications go live in December and we'll make sure you all receive that I would very much so welcome, though, in the time being, uh, you reaching out. If you have questions, you can go to info at jnj.org or my email address, my last name, Koch at jnj.org. So tried to hit on all those really quickly, Katie. I may have left something out. Oh, you put them in the chat. Yes, good, cool. I did. Yeah, no, Drew, that's that's good. Um, thank you for that. And um, we have in our waning minute, um, we have two questions that are quite specific, so um, they're probably good for those people who need to get to another meeting. Um, the first one is, is there any possibility that the new program might be open to applications, not just from campuses, but also from other groups such as disciplinary societies who can work across institutions? So right now, um, we're looking at uh, institutions and or systems of which institutions are a part. It's not that we're opposed to disciplinary societies. We love disciplinary societies. We're, you know, the American Historical Association, uh, Mathematical Association of America, the so, uh, the APA, et cetera, et cetera, right? We're good collaborators with all of them. Um, that shared, we don't have that built into the model right now, but we'd be open to considering that. So if you're affiliated with a discipline association and you want to... Uh, have a conversation around that, feel free to reach out to me. Let's let's see what might be possible. All right. And the last question um, we have here in the chat is, um, uh, say it's, I'm from OSU and we're currently partnering with Gardner um, at, on Gateways to Completion, the Curricular Analytics Community, and um, Excellence in Academic Advising through the PACE project. So how is this different um, from PACE? And do you think that an institution would benefit from further from doing this work? So this is a fairly complex answer, which won't get answered in just a couple of minutes, but I'll give a high level response and then let's delve deeper um, at a time that's convenient for you. And that is we have learned from the pedagogy advising and curricular excellence process a great deal and that's been rolled in and applied to this work. The difference with PACE is we worked with six institutions over three years, um, and the lessons learned there, both um, good lessons, here's what we want to replicate, and lessons which are still good, but here's what we would not do if we do this again, are factored into this broader design. The other difference is that it's a longer time commitment because we recognize three years are not enough. And in PACE, we had a model where every institution had to do the same thing. And here we learned from PACE that just because that timing sounds good to us doesn't mean it wouldn't necessarily work with the institutions. So we're taking a more customized approach in this work. And with a larger cohort, 
there'll still be sub cohorts involved in the same experiences. So there are some key differences, but again, would love to delve into that deeper um, if, if there's interest in doing so. Excellent, thank you. And um, Dr. I hope I don't mispronounce your name, Daya Varante, if you would like to have a further conversation, if you just wanna um, email info or Drew directly, we'll um, set something up happily. Um, and so the next question is, what does the application process include? So what's gonna happen in the process? Sure, so we have a template that's not unlike um, other applications we've used for our sort of single focus processes, um, where a person creates an account. If they already have one, they use an existing account on the Gardner Institute's platform. And then they you know, fill out general information about themselves and anybody else that is submitting the application with them, contact information, role, that sort of thing. Um, they answer a uh, few key questions that help contextualize how this work fits with institutions, broader um, strategic efforts and imperative. And they indicate that uh, both the chief executive officer and chief academic officer support this work. Now, it doesn't mean we don't want to hear from other senior level leaders or from faculty level leaders, but at a minimum, we need to know that is the case for, with the CEO and the CAO. We then Consider that uh, along with some other uh, data that we pull out of publicly available data sources and we get back in touch. We follow up with every application that's submitted. Um, and then um, after that initial conversation with the person or persons who submitted it, we schedule a conversation with the CEO, CEO, and whoever else submitted the application. Sometimes it is the CEO and the CAO, but often it's not. And it's just to make sure that there's a commitment five-year commitment to doing this work. And if that commitment's there, we then, and all signs point to yes, we then proceed with issuing an agreement and launching the institution in this process, right? So it's probably more than what you wanted to know. Um, you can start an account uh, once the application is live and take a look at the questions. It's not like the minute you open it, you have to answer it. It's not like timed. It's not a... Uh, high stakes, high pressure sort of thing. But know that we see that you will have started an account and we'll reach out to see if you have questions and there will be a finite application date and we'll accept on a rolling basis. So it, it behooves you to finish it in a timely manner, but um, on another level, uh, you don't have to get it done overnight. Excellent. Thank you. I think that we have answered all the questions. I do know, I think I wasn't the only one who was sort of um, booted out. I noticed a couple of people came back in late. So if anybody um, who did come back in has any other questions, um, we would be happy to um, answer them. And um, as I put in the chat earlier, we will send out a recording of today's session to everyone who is um, who is registered today. And Drew, are we going to do this again? We will. We may not do it exactly like this again. We welcome your feedback on this, right? But um, this actually is, and we're excited to see the type of participation we had, but this is the, the first time we've done this to a broader audience. So um, Katie knows the dates or will share dates soon. When we I do. do know the date of the next one is um, December 5th at 11 a.m. Eastern. So, so um, bring friends. Exactly. Right. If there if there's somebody on your at your institution who you think ought to be here, let them know about it. When we send out the recording, we'll have a link to register there so you can share that with people. Yeah, and if there's anything you wish we were clear about or wasn't here, like we're highly educated people, which means we know with great certainly, certainty we don't know it all. And there are things we can probably do better the next time we do this overview. So feel free to reach out, ask us questions directly, um, but also feel free to just make some suggestions on how we can make this clearer for you and your colleagues. Excellent. And one last question. I keep saying that. <laughs> Was the cost for the lower enrolled institutions twenty thousand dollars over five years or twenty thousand dollars for five years? Each of the five years, and it, it, and we'll get the exact structure. It's in the sort of lower twenty k range. We're still finalizing that, and it also will depend probably a little bit 
on institutional endowment. I'll be forthright with you. An institution that has a thousand students and $5 billion may wind in an endowment. And there are some who do, let's be forthright. From an equity standpoint, it, it we may uh, have a little bit more support coming from those institutions so that institutions that have uh, a similar enrollment, but not much endowment can also participate at a fee they can sustain. Excellent. So that's why I haven't given you exact details. It's not because I'm trying to be furtive. It's actually because I want to make sure when we get the evidence out there, A, we can sustain this, but A, one before A, you can sustain it as well. Yeah, excellent. Well, thank you, Drew. Um, we appreciate your time. We appreciate the time of all the participants today. And as we said, we'll be in touch and we thank you for your um, questions and your um, attention today. So thank you all. Thanks all.